Yeah, g'day guys and welcome back to my channel. Now this isn't really the video I was planning to make this week. I thought it was going to be a really cool making a piston video where I'd start from scratch, cast the pistons, machine them, get them all finished. Yeah, I thought it would be cool. Instead of finishing that off, I'm now troubleshooting an electrical problem on my Mahu CNC mill. Might need some help from you, so stick around till the end. Maybe you can help me out with how to approach this. There's a second issue as well in this week's video, and that is normally I use these little Rode Wireless Go microphones, but unfortunately, this one's now for at least three years old and the battery was starting to get weak. So I found a video online of how to replace the little battery in it. So I got stuck into that, replaced it, but I seem to have bricked it because it now no longer works either with the original battery or with the new battery. So I've, so I've ordered a replacement uh, microphone. In the meantime, I went back to just recording on this little Sony dictaphone thing, which would work better if I had a decent scratch audio track in the camera. So I added this little shotgun mic onto my camera to pick up my ambient noises. But the problem was I forgot that this thing needs plug-in power. So now that that's set, hopefully for the rest of my videos, that'll work for me. Need to set that to a custom function. So then it's on every time I turn on the camera. So I'm gonna try and fake it. Some of it's gonna be voiceover and some of it's gonna be probably some reggae. Now once I've machined the outside of these pistons, I'm going to need to cut the ring grooves and they're supposed to be 1.5 millimeter thick. Now I've got a few options for that. My normal part of blade, this one, is too thick. I also have this thin one, but it's still two millimeters ish This nice high speed steel is two and a half. This one's two point whatever. But look at this. This little T-section part off blade will be perfect. Unfortunately, I don't have a holder for it. This holder's close, but it's set up for 10 millimeters, and this is 12. So I need one of these for one of them. Now obviously the other option would be just simply getting on the tool grinder and thinning out the tip of this one and just using it. But if I do that, I'll never have a tool holder for this one. So let's do a little side project make a tool holder. Right, so if that blade was 10, it looks like they gave it about three millimeters of meat on the holder above and below, so I'll do the same. Whipped up a quick sketch here, so let's go and chop it out. Now for the next operation, I'm going to need to use one of these slitting saws, both to relieve the cross the top bit and to cut the deep relief groove in it. So to do that, I need the vertical head out of the way.
Right, so here's the finished part. I'm quite happy with it, although I've already picked up a bump from the screws on the tool holder, so I probably should have case hardened this, but oh well, it'll work. That screws just to give you a bit of pre-clamping on the thing, so the blade doesn't slide around while you're trying to adjust it in the main tool holder. Like this, it's still a bit flexible at the front. But once you drop it in here and crank it down nice and hard, that stops that deflection. Now before I can try that out, I still need to bore the pin holes on my pistons. So I'll do that first. The rings and the final dimension come after that. I just realized that after I replaced the spindle bearings, I never retrammed the head of the mill. So let's take a look at it. Okay, that's way off. Right, well, after a bit of dicking around with it. Within about a hundredth of a millimeter, I think that's as good as I'm gonna get it. On a previous video, I already made a mandrel to correctly align the pistons while I machined them. Right, now I did a little bluing on this just to make sure I've got a good, firm, repeatable seat for these pistons. And this feels really good. So now I need to flip this up and then do the piston holes. I like to put a bit of this waxy stuff underneath my tools between them and the table. Unfortunately the slots on this don't line up so I'll just have to use clamps. This is just a test cut on one of my mini scrap pistons just to see if I'm actually set up correctly to nail the center of the cast in pin boss. Now I was taught that drills don't make round, straight or smooth holes. So a drill is only used for making the initial undersized hole. Then a boring bar is used to straighten up the drill's wandering hole and make it round. And finally, a ream is used to bring it up to the correct dimension and give it a nice smooth surface finish. Now recently I was lucky to be able to purchase a whole bunch of small carbide boring heads. But unfortunately, they all have quite small shank. Therefore, I'll need to make a sleeve to be able to mount this in the boring head. I'll drill a hole through the side of the sleeve so that the boring head scrub screw can go through it and clamp directly onto the shank of the boring tool. I ended up making two of them. One as a split collar for the boring bar and also made the other one with the hole through it which is going to be used for cutting a circlip groove. Well at that point I thought I had everything nicely set up so I went ahead and tried out my tooling parts and everything. This is the first piston I worked on. Everything was looking good. In fact everything went, went fine throughout the entire cycle here. After first drilling the 10 millimeter hole I then used the boring bar to take the hole out to a couple of tenths under the reaming size. That was fine. Reaming also left a really nice surface finish. I'm, I'm really glad at how these piston pin bores are turning out. So I thought I was all set up to quickly go through all of the pistons I've cast, but it wasn't to be. 
This is kind of a bummer. I plumped down the pendant and for some reason it freaked out the machine. When I look at this error, it's not finding the pin for the external e-stop, but that doesn't mean that the wiring to the e-stop's broken because that would simply mean an e-stop. What it actually means is that the Mesa control board, which that's connected to, is not booting properly. It means I need to pull the whole machine forward to open the cabinet at the back and wiggle the connectors because it's probably going to be a connector issue. So first up I'll just wiggle the control cable to the Mesa 7i84 I.O. card. And then while I'm in here I'll also wiggle the edge connector for the Maho's relay board because an intermittent contact on this connector was one of the faults the machine had when I first got it. Okay, right, well that wasn't it because I've still got exactly the same error message. Oh, wait a minute. It's this one again. This has happened once before. No idea why. It's only happened once in five years, this being the second time. I'll reset it and see what happens. Okay, switching on again. Boom. This is now dropping consistently. Seems to be dropping fuse number 6F3 reliably. Where's that? 6F2, 6F3. This is the one it's dropping. So I'm going to need to do some troubleshooting here. This is one of my 24 volt control rails. I've got two of them and that's why I'm getting the Mesa card error because it's t field power is coming off that 24 volt rail. Before I dig any deeper into the troubleshooting of the downstream system, that fuse is also 40 years old. So just to isolate whether the fuse is the problem, I'll interchange fuse two and fuse three and see whether the problem moves or whether the problem stays. Okay, so when I did my Linux CNC conversion, I tapped into this 24 volt rail to provide power to my Mesa cards. So what I've now done is just disconnect that extra line. Let's see if the problem is in the stuff I added or in the original Maho stuff. I know what I'm going to be guessing. No, so the problem is in the original Maho stuff. That surprises me. Some of you Sparkies out there, what would be your recommendation for the next troubleshooting steps? I guess I need to start by measuring the current because that's a 2 amp 24 volt fuse. Obviously it's drawing more than 2 amps. It's taking a while for the fuse to drop. The naming stickers in the cabinet don't quite line up. So it's actually 6F2 which is dropping. This controls power to two different 24 volt rails. But rail 200 only activates through the 7K1 contactor, which is not closed when you first turn on the machine. So the problem must be in the 204 rail. I've only had a quick look because I need to get editing, but it looks like the only things on that 204 rail are my Mesa cards field power and then the original e-stop chain. It's kind of interesting, the whole e-stop chain is basically a short circuit, except for that coil. Right, well I edited this video Saturday night, and then slept on it, and it kind of nagged me that the initial fault occurred when I put the pendant down, like bumped the pendant down a bit harder. So let's take a look at that. Now if I am shorting out between these, this e-stop and ground, probably pretty easy to find, so let's open her up and have a look. So it would have to be the black and the white wires that are shorting somewhere. Huh? At the moment I've got e-stop open, which means this should be a short circuit. Weird. What about to the housing? No, there's nothing obvious there. I can't remember what pins I connected this to, but I think I've got a drawing of it. Well, that's kind of weird. I don't measure a short to ground between this and the casing. I don't see any chafing on these wires, although they are very poorly rooted. It's just a rat's nest in here. I wonder what I'm doing wrong here. Voila. 
So as expected, the problem was not in the Maho wiring, it was in my wiring. So the machine's back in operation and that's brilliant, so I can get back on with making my pistons. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching, I'll see you next time.